Thank you. Okay. So now. Emotion. Okay, before, before it disintegrates, all, all you practicing architects who love icons, this is the moment <laughs> to do a comeback. <laughs> yes, and we are going to start. <laughs> Those of us who still want to build. <laughs> Okay. All right. So this is the uh, the architects panel. <laughs> the first um, panelist I'm really delighted to introduce is Hashem Sarkis. Hashem is an architect, an educator, a scholar, and he just became dean at MIT. Congratulations, Hashem. Um, his firm, Hashim Saki Studio, is based in Beirut, Lebanon, and also in Cambridge, Massachusetts. From 1995 to this year, Hashim has taught design and architecture history and theory at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. And in 2004, he became the Aga Khan Professor of Landscape Architecture and Urbanism in Muslim Societies, also at the GSD. His publications include Circa 1958, Lebanon in the Pictures and Plans of Constantinos Doxiades, Projecting Beirut, uh, as well as Joseph Louis Sert, the architect of urban design. Today he, he will talk to us about his experience building or designing the Biblos Town Hall. Welcome, Hashem. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I, uh, I want to thank Amal and Nora for being so patient with my uh, absence because of illness, but I am well medicated. <laughs> Hopefully that will take me through my presentation, hopefully even through the panel. Uh, <clears throat> two years ago, we won a competition for the town hall of the city of Biblos, which is the structure here. Uh, the competition was uh, an open competition. It was an anonymous competition and it was in black and white. The organizers of the competition thought that by eliminating color, they would give more equality to the uh, contributors or to the participants in the competition. The, vo the proposal we made, which was to be placed on the interchange, the highway interchange, the site was given, was three different volumes floating over a park to allow the park to continue and not eat away from it, uh, leaning on a noise barrier and over a common lobby which is shared by the three programmatic entities. I'll come back to the competition, but I want to start by presenting a very dynamic group, which is the Municipal Council of the city of Biblos. Uh, rather young, the uh, mayor himself is 37 years old, and uh, atypical in terms of the energy that they have, uh, typical in terms of their uh, religious representation of the Lebanese society in terms of Muslims, Christian proportionally, according to the town's population. And I have to say atypical in terms of the high or relatively high presence of women on the committee. There's only one, but it's significantly higher than usual in Lebanon. <laughs> and this is Biblos. <coughs> Biblos has almost everything going for it. It's acknowledged to be one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. Uh, French mandate excavations uh, discovered pre-Phoenician sites under the old city. They basically gutted out the historic city, 
uh, left only this part of it. UNESCO uh, came and called it a World Heritage Site. It's kind of the kiss of UNESCO or the curse of UNESCO. It's, it's still up to us to decide. And uh, the city has residues of the uh, Crusader castles, two of them, one here, one on the water in the bay, uh, the Roman axis, and then the sporadic growth over the agricultural fields that hit the mountains here, plus the old coastal road and the highway. The site of the, of the town hall is here, deliberately chosen to bridge between two sides of the city that have been amputated by the highway. This is the archaeological site. This is the view of the city with the archaeology, the Crusader Castle here, the Arab city here, Roman axis, and the new town and Mount Lebanon. And this is the view in the reverse. This is the picturesque small harbor dating back from Crusader even older times. And these are kind of the paraphernalia of the city that has been over the years accumulating a lot of tricks to attract tourists or different uh, strategies for tourist attraction. There's a Hacienda de Pepe, Jardin du Biblos Fisherman Club, so three languages in one, just in case you didn't understand the other two. Uh, religious tourism has become quite big. This is the uh, a Crusader uh, Church of St. John. <coughs> And uh, even though the Muslim population is tiny, they have revived many of the mosques in the old city in waiting for the tourists. And when the situation politically is good, the tourists come in huge numbers. Biblos is the highest visited site in Lebanon, about one million people. This is during the very famous Biblos festival when the guerrillas, for the first time ever, showed their faces to the public. Uh, and this is the old bazaar of the town, restored several times, and waiting for the tourists. This is a picture taken a few days ago in preparation for Christmas, but clearly reflecting a kind of anxiety, uh, a kind of post-ISIS anxiety. In working with the municipality, it became very clear that the town hall, as an emblematic building, re required a lot of propping up, and that even though they had a lot of initiatives going on in the city, <coughs> Uh, they needed some framework to put all of these initiatives together and to highlight certain problems that they would prepare in packages for potential donors, whether local or international. And we helped them work through key components, such as the transportation plan for Metropolitan Biblos, land use plan for the old town, key public places and sites and where to invest, uh, a highway frontage, the main entrances to the city, and then the town hall, not just the building, but the site plan. Uh, <laughs> this is not a very clear picture, but this is probably, this is the kind of municipal drawings that we're working from. And uh, this is a kind of collage of the different municipalities that make up uh, Biblos. And just to show you the mm, hodgepodge fabric, and uh, these are the key features we identified for them as being the major barriers within the continuity and connectedness of the city. The east-west mountain road and the north-south coastal road. This is their uh, three, uh, trois voies, the kind of hierarchy of roads to again emphasize the chaotic nature of them but also the redundancy between the primary and secondary system of roads. And as a way of trying to pull it together, this kind of overdetermined but fragmented fabric, we started proposing certain figurations in the urban planning of the city. And the first figure that we identified is a potential ring road that just takes existing path and connects it together with widening, very simply widening the passages under the highway, identifying spots for connection with the network, and using the transport system that they currently use for tourists over seasons for the everyday uh, movement of the citizens. Uh, these are the buses, the electric buses parked at the end of the Roman axis. Uh, the other figure that we try to identify or to at least heighten through signage and through uh, landscape work are the further entrances and exits to the city. <laughs> uh, 
as a way of uh, releasing pressure from the inner interchange. And uh, that we're working on right now. The other figures we tried to extract were the abandoned railroad tracks, which again, with the other municipalities, they're connecting them together through a, f a form of surface rail. They have a partnership with a French city that is supplying them with the uh, test rails now. And also using these to highlight the public spaces. Uh, but we're also trying to emphasize the east-west, which is the more topographically challenged pal passages that are now being built around streams. One of them is being prepared right now as the first one, which is the path that takes you up to the Balat of Shubail and the source of Adonis. This, again, uh, mythological site. But we have been insisting with them that the frontage on the highway should not be ignored, even though it's mostly a surface road, but the highway should be understood to be a face of the city. And the fact that they put the town hall there is also part of that. There's an attempt, earlier attempt, to reconnect all of the figures, and uh, we're now working with them for a plan through a series of uh, community sessions to begin to articulate those projects a bit more and to create a kind of hierarchy, priority, for which ones to get funded first. But the interchange where the town hall sits is a very difficult site because here we do have the figure, but the figure is not very well connected. Uh, the Roman axis stops under paths where the UNESCO pavilion is, and there's a big bus parking here, but that's not used except when the big buses come, and they rarely do. And the site of the municipality was supposedly am am amputated from the rest, but we tried to create a continuum underneath it. And by softening the traffic, we're hoping that this path through widening two pedestrian bridges will support the activities of the municipality with this parking and will allow for connection to this area, which is becoming a major commercial hub up here. Uh, a site plan, the view of the area. But in contrast, the town hall sits in a rather underdetermined area. Uh, leftovers of agriculture, a gas station, a new bank building. And so we focused a lot on creating a, a zone here that could be protected, it becomes a public zone with a noise barrier and the three volumes floating above. You know. These are the bleached plans of the project. Bleached. This is the section where it shows clearly how the park and the public zone remains continuous underneath it and the section in relation to highway. And this is construction photos. <clears throat> this is the uh, bleachers, which are part of the, uh, of the stadium, which is a big stair underneath the outdoor space. The space is between the buildings, a view back with the lobby. And this is the view of the three volumes along the highway. It's supposed to be seen quickly. And uh, these are the three volumes seen from the interior. The main issue of contention with the city was the use of sandstone. Initially, when we submitted the competition entry, we sort of photoshopped sandstone there as a way of just rendering something resembling the city and uh, using a material that is quite familiar. We weren't very convinced about it, and we tried to get out of it, but somehow we got stuck. We got stuck because the city, it turned out, was plastering sandstone everywhere. And this is the rented town hall, temporary rented town hall, all made out of sandstone. This is a new building. Along the Roman axis, they decided to revive a kind of arabesque like uh, George was talking about in a kind of uh, hodgepodge mix of motifs to make what they call the Lebanese Arab architecture. These are all facades being applied along the road. And despite our uh, reservations about it, they also started applying it along the highway. This is the sandstone used along one of the buildings. It's kind of a bit of a Jean Nouvel detail here. Hala will be upset with me if I say that. <laughs> but the way that the sandstone works is actually very problematic. I really don't like it as a material. It's never meant to be exposed, but somehow with time it has become a material that is used for exterior applications. It stains, uh, <coughs> its color is inconsistent, and it, uh, it, it, it's very soft, at least the local stone is very soft, and the quarries of the harder stones are lost. But 
the city has gone to apply it in very different ways. This is what they call the antiquated approach to sandstone, uh, right next to the fountain celebrating the Phoenician alphabet in the city. And these are some modern attempts to use it but protect it as well. It's not required but almost encouraged. And it's required in the old souk. And uh, they're so obsessed with it that they're now exposing it from under growing vaults, which was supposed to be protected by plaster because it's actually not a very safe stone to use on the interiors because of moisture. And this is, again, a church with sandstone. And even though the public monuments, the main features of them were not built out of sandstone, but limestone, they ignore that. And they see it in front of them rotting, but they still use it. Uh, we, we bought a stock of sandstone, we had no choice, and we were looking at it, and a few things helped us decide what to use. One was a stacking of stones that we saw and re realized that when you have it in thin strips, you can actually work better with the colors, you can control the colors better. And with uh, Ma'alam Nazmi, a Syrian uh, uh, stonemason, we started identifying the sizes that would be very good for him to be able to place on the facade and to be able to separate the colors. So we came down to about seven centimeters by 2.5, and we're working with the lengths that are variable. There, we tried different techniques, but we decided the mortar is out because mortar stains the stone. And accidentally, working with another project, I thought that the pattern of travertino has the same color range of a yellow travertine, has the same color range as the, <coughs> as the uh, stones we had. And used it as a way also to make the stones look, the blocks look even more monolithic by carrying the pattern through. We then pixelated it into uh, three, then four different color strands. We injected it here and there, uh, certain QR codes, and uh, cut them on the site, and then distributed them on the site in different color stacks. And the pixelated map was in some zones drawn up for the masons, but approximated with the eye from a distance. And this is Malam Nazmi in front of his workshop and earth. The thinness of it has helped us a lot, not to hide, but when you come closer to the thing, you realize that it's actually not one big stone, but just very, very thin veneer uh, that we can deal with the corners. This is the front facade with a park underneath. This is the corner. These are the three volumes. And we tried in this kind of underdetermined way to introduce architecture play on language as well. Biblos being the, <coughs> the s supposed origin of the alphabet that binds the whole of the Mediterranean together. But uh, initially, we had a pergola covering the underbellies, and we had a kind of curtain wall for the facades. Uh, we, in trying different iterations, went for a total curtain wall on the facades, but kept the pergola. But then we thought that maybe if we use a barcode system for both, it would unify them together. And this is the technique we're using. It's an aluminum lining, Prussian blue, uh, which fits, it inserts itself between the boxes, almost like they are the cuts between the otherwise monolithic block. Here again, we're playing with a barcode, started with a spacing from Biblos, uh, but we don't know what we're going to get in terms of reading. This is the facade with the bridges between the volumes. And again here, revealing the thinness of the stone next to the aluminum. And this is an interior view. The furniture choice was rejected in favor of mo mobilia rather than <laughs> this. And uh, this is the uh, view underneath. Uh, lastly, one of the main, main components of the project is to have a multifunctional space here which Initially, they want to house an alphabet museum in it, along with the wall outside. We pulled in the wall outside because it would be a way of linking people who park here into the building, uh, but also in order to create an element for a budget for the landscape. If it, the landscape has no budget, it has no function, they will not uh, support it. So <clears throat> while waiting for the alphabet museum money to come, we thought that we could create this wall as a mural for local artists to work with. But the city encouraged us to do the first mural ourselves. So we tried to work with it as a wallpaper so that in case 
they want to hang things on it in the future, they can. We, instead of looking at the evolution of the alphabets new, uh, in terms of different alphabets and languages, we decided to abstract it more towards geometries so that the letters and the figures become more interchanged between letters you read and geometric figures. And we laid them out <coughs> as uh, patterns that you would almost read very fast if you're walking against it, or they become like any pattern of wallpaper, except that they're moving at different speeds with each other. And uh, this is the pattern, and this is the way in which that pattern would sit in the lobby superimposed against the pattern of the barcode and the pattern of the brick, if you see it from the other side. The building will open in May 2015. There'll be a ribbon cutting in the outside space. You're all invited to come. <laughs> uh, but it's very, just as a, a conclusion, this is kind of attempt to uh, think of architectural surfaces as possibly surfaces where exchange between science systems can happen. And that, uh, <coughs> that architecture could also come, come again to be uh, hospitable to different languages, different art forms, n rather than being dictating all of that on its, on its own. Uh, th thank you very much for inviting me, but also thank you for raising a question that over the past 10 years I've been trying very hard to avoid in the other kind program at Harvard. Uh, but you're absolutely right. This question of identity keeps uh, scuttling back in, no matter how much we push it away. It's almost like it has never left. And I find it nowadays under every stone I turn and every stone I build. Thank you very much. Our next panel, panelist is Ali Manjera, who is the founding director of Manjera Ivar Architecture, based in London and Barcelona. Prior to forming his firm with his partner Ada Ivar, Ali was working with SOM in Chicago and Zaha Hadid in London. Ali is also a building expert panel member on the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment in the UK. His title today is Rethinking Iconography in the Arab City. Arab cities, uh, irrespective of geography and uh, socio-political context, can be explained in large part through iconography. Icons by their very na nature are not accidental, but strategic markers uh, that provide a narrative through which we see the city. The value of icons, both human and in building form, is related in part to the simple and effective means to communicate. Like Gothic gargoyles, icons are storyboards that communicate modernity, progress and strength and more recently describe an approach to tradition and identity. Some may recoil at the idea of icons, of iconic cities, but icons are very much part of contemporary culture, and they are here to stay. In emergent cities, the impetus for iconography is the rawness of the city fabric, the permissive planning policy, finance, leadership, and legacy, and a people hungry for change and progress. But let us not forget also that when cities are still in formation, each and every building is iconic. In more recent times and in the context of global stagnation, iconography can too easily be dismissed by newfound regionalism that strives to put on a veneer of local identity, but its image and its execution is simply a, a better and more articulated postmodern paradigm through which uh, a postmodern paradigm that is seen through the prism of a bygone era, altogether a bygone altogether imaginary era before the black gold bonanza. If we accept that iconography to a, a greater or larger extent is a requisite and indeed an integral part of, uh, of our urban tapestry, as architects and planners, the aim will be to create iconic places as well as iconic spaces. In the vanguard of the Arab Spring, there was perhaps a newfound optimism that cities will no longer be privatized and control fiefdoms and that icons too will be responsive to civic needs beyond the simplicity and ubiquity, ubiquitous call of the retail mall. To this end, rethinking iconography requires architects and clients to address the complexities of space making that is unique to the Middle East context. The role of culture and religion 
the idea of the family and the positive contribution women can make. As part of our own work and research, there's a sincerity that is emerging on the Education City campus, Doha, where architecture, interior space, and urban connectivity is being recalibrated to address the fundamental question of Islam and its relationship with learning. These are just some of the iconic buildings that are popping up in, in Doha and not far from the airport. And of course, um, some of the iconic buildings that are complete, the zigzag towers. Uh, Musharrab as well, in its own right, is an uh, idea of iconography and uh, tradition. Us, uh, our project on the Education City campus is, uh, is really related to education, of course. And by that, we started uh, looking at the um, Sultan Hassan Mosque in, in Cairo, where uh, religion, Islam, let's say, and teaching and, and prayer were contained in one space. This is the Education City campus. Uh, the size of it is quite, a, it's quite in, enormous in relation to the whole city of Doha, but you can see the emphasis on education just in terms of a uh, land area. Uh, the project, uh, we, we decided that um, it's important to create this relationship between uh, praying space, the mosque on one side, and the academic space within the building. So there's a kind of an infinite, infinite spiral between uh, knowledge um, and light, the light of the mosque. We looked at uh, historic buildings, we looked at um, the plan of historic uh, teaching places, kuliyas, uh, Islamic um, places where education and also prayer are combined. Uh, we looked at different mosque typologies and the evolution of mosques in, in different parts of the world, uh, from a very simple Arab uh, mosque to a very complex uh, Turkish mosque. Uh, we looked at um, ideas of what can constitute Islamic architecture or a so-called Islamic architecture. Um, geometry and light and color and calligraphy. Uh, we made a direct comparison between the, the Sultan Hassan Mosque in Cairo and, and how the uh, teaching spaces are on the perimeter of the building and how we can create that within our building at, at Education City. Pathways to light. The idea of uh, walking along the, the campus and uh, finding the, the university. So these are the plans. So you have the, the teaching um, accommodation on one side and the faculty offices on one side, the mosque being the largest part, one, one corner, where the minarets pronounced and the infinite spiral so you can go to the mosque or be educated at the same time. This is the building and construction. The idea of how we then distill um, the, the bigger ideas into the smaller spaces. So, for example, we have uh, corridors and internal spaces where we explore and make, uh, make apparent the different uh, stages of phases of Islamic uh, architecture and Islamic uh, key, let's say, Islamic buildings, iconic buildings. And how, for example, we're using um, these motifs which are photographs of, of historic buildings and we, we, we space them out through the building. So it becomes a journey, so it's not just the building itself but also the internal space and the corridor spaces and, and how they, they can become um, uh, a place to anchor historic uh, motifs. Uh, classroom spaces, uh, we were looking, uh, these are early images, we're looking at um, biological um, manuscripts and how we can project them onto, onto the glazed, glazed walls. How we can use calligraphy on the main courtyard of the, of the building. These are some of the GRC panels that are going up now with the, with the calligraphy. How we're using calligraphy on the minarets. under construction at the moment. How the, the mosque area is um, a very key and uh, expressed element within the building and uh, the, the renders and also the, the actual space itself.
this is um, we've got this enormous cascade which is where they make uh, ablution the ablution cascade essentially it separates the university from the mosque area in a very symbolic way you hear the, the water coming down as you're, in, as you're inside the mosque praying that's the ablution cascade We did a study of the pattern on the facade and how we can create a kind of a morphing pattern that changes as it goes around the building. So we're using kind of advanced parametric design in terms of um, Islamic patterning, how that can be uh, used. This is a, a contentious element. We're using calligraphy on one of the main um, facades of the building and the idea is that we also don't have shadow where you're walking on the words of the Quran so there's a kind of a two or three skin solution to that how the the building itself is supported on the five pillars of Islam uh, which uh, again are kind of symbolic in, in the way they they support and elevate the mosque under under which we have water This is the morphing pattern that we were developing for the building. And uh, some of the glazing units in the library. We have uh, four gardens. Um, traditionally, the Islamic, um, the, the Islamic garden is, in a, is, is a four-part garden. So this is one of the gardens, a uh, garden of uh, light, I think it is. And then just looking at how we uh, pattern the skin, tiling. That's it. Thank you, Ali. Um, our last panelist is Halawarde. Hala has worked with Jean Nouvel for over 25 years and in 1999 became a partner of Atelier Jean Nouvel where um, she was responsible for major projects in Europe, the Far East, the Middle East and the US. Six years ago, Hala Werde established her own practice, HW Architecture in Paris, which um, she has been running in parallel to her ongoing collaboration with Atelier Jean Nouvel. She will be speaking about the Abu Dhabi Louvre um, today. Welcome, Hala. Thank you. Louvre Abu Dhabi, not Abu Dhabi Louvre. Le Louvre Abu Dhabi. Um, yes, I want to talk about this project. Um, and uh, I think this project is, uh, illustrates very well the notion of contextualism, contextualism. Uh, there were some um, discussions this morning about the, the international architects building in this, uh, in this region and the meaning of, um, of this architecture. But contextualism is not only a question of uh, space or, um, or, uh, or form, it is also, it is really creating um, all the conditions that make you do something in a place that you could not do elsewhere. And this project has uh, a lot of um, uh, parameters that uh, condition this uh, uh, architecture, not only in terms of brief, but in a, in a, in a historical, geographical, and political context that I will try to explain. Uh, Jean Nouvel likes to define himself as a contextual architect, and um, he never does the same building in uh, in uh, in a place. And we are trying to find every time meanings for uh, making these buildings in special places. This project will talk about. Uh, sorry, how does it work? 
uh, I will talk about all these, all these parameters that, and all the reasons that made this project happen. Uh, we're in uh, the Emirates at the crossroads of uh, Arab world and uh, Asia. We're in Saadiyat Island, Island of Happiness, next to the city of Abu Dhabi. The, the island is uh, completely desert. It's uh, the encounter of uh, the sand and the water. We cannot arrive by, uh, by car. You have to fly or take a boat to arrive. And we see nothing but uh, the sand, the water, and uh, an extraordinary light in the day, a different light actually in the day, depending on the time you see it and a very interesting uh, sky in the evening. And all these components will be the components of our museum. It's a young city, 50 years old. There is not really a history behind this. There is a cultural uh, context. Uh, we're in 2006 and Tom Krenz, uh, former director of Guggenheim is asked, by the Emirati to help them develop a cultural district in this island. I don't know if Ali worked with SOM on this plan. There was some plans, different plans, master plans to, that were developed. And this cultural district with the idea to make uh, this place uh, a real cultural destination in the world with uh, the idea to have four, five big cultural institutions, a contemporary art museum, Guggenheim, perform a museum of civilization, this was our brief uh, when we started working, uh, performing art center, and a maritime museum, and a national museum. And uh, Tom Krenz proposed a casting of international architects um, Frank Gehry for the Guggenheim, Norman Foster, this was a competition, but Jean Nouvel for the Museum of Civilization, Zaha Hadid for the Performing Arts Center, and Tada Wando for the Maritime Museum. And they developed a plan, master plan, that was uh, inspired by Venice with the, this idea of having different um, pavilions and uh, and making uh, uh, these institution and installation complementary to each other uh, to, to create this, uh, this cultural uh, destination. Uh, in the meantime, we didn't know when we were working on the project, but there were secret negotiations between French and Emirati uh, discussing about uh, uh, what will, was going to become uh, unprecedented intergovernmental agreement between Emirates and France, uh, the Louvre Abu Dhabi project. So it's the first time Louvre and Abu Dhabi are put together in one name. Uh, it's a 30-year it's uh, program for um, offering French expertise to develop this cultural um, uh, program or this museum, helping uh, in um, uh, acquisitions and loans, uh, acquisitions for a permanent collection, and uh, in the meantime, uh, lending works of art to the Emiratis for this, uh, for this museum. So there, of course, everyone talked a lot about this project uh, at the time, and there was a little polemic about the French uh, lending uh, artworks uh, in a country that was in a, a little bit uh, uh, far, and, um, and even the concept of Louvre Abu Dhabi was, uh, was a little bit strange at that time. It's, uh, it's changed a lot since then. So uh, we had the chance when we started working to know what uh, Frank Gehry and Zahadid were doing on each side of this, of this coast. And the first idea was to do something that was on the sea and uh, a, a very horizontal structure uh, that was like an archipelago of, uh, of a city 
as if it was uh, emerging from the sand, from the water, and floating like a, as if it existed as a re reversed archaeology, as if it was there since always. Um, it's also questioning the, que the, the, the notion of what is a, a museum uh, today. Uh, not just a building where you open a door and you see the artworks. It's, uh, it's the idea and the, the concept of having a little neighborhood. Uh, the museum is here to uh, create uh, encounters of people gathering in its place. And so we created um, not a building but a, an urban um, place. Uh, for this uh, museum to to uh, to happen, this uh, building is it's actually a series of uh, different buildings that are organized in a in a hidden order uh, based on on this uh, on, on an urban plan, creating not only uh, rooms for artworks but also external spaces where people can also um, gather, walk um, in in, a, in different uh, external promenades. So this is uh, in grey the the external works. Every building is a room. And you go from one building to another uh, through different passages. You always have the consciousness of the space, uh, and and the and the work with light is is something that will be very important in the, in the work in the development of this project. So it's uh, it's like an island in the island, uh, and um, we wanted uh, for this little neighborhood to have um, uh, create a microclimate to have people uh, be able to uh, um, walk in these external spaces and being protected. And we uh, brought this idea of the dome, which is, uh, of course, a reference to the uh, Arab architecture, but not only the Arab architecture. It's a universal form, but it's a dome. It done in a in an urban scale, in a, it's 180 meters large, and it's partially covering this uh, this little uh, city, this museum city. It is done in a very contemporary way. I will explain it. The, the, this is the, the the these are the buildings that are. Uh, um, that create this uh, this little city that all have their own uh, scale, uh, own uh, um, reference or uh, own identity, uh, depending on what will be inside. So they are a one uh, level volume housing the the collection of uh, of the Louvre Abu Dhabi. There's a permanent collection uh, spaces. There's a temporary exhibition. You have an auditorium, a cafe, a restaurant, etc. And they all have their own uh, uh, openings. They all have windows or skylights, or sometimes they don't have. But they all depend. They 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 have their uh, own geometry that is completely in correspondence with what they will house uh, as a collection. Uh, so this dome covers the the city in a, in a scale that is, uh, as I said, quite big, 180 meters large, and this is done in a, it is a very complex uh, geometry that is not only uh, a, a reference. Of course, you have the reference to the geometry and light, the Arab reference to geometry and light. And we have developed, this is just to give you an idea of um, the La Cour Carré du Louvre. It's in, in Paris, just to give you an idea of the scale of this dome. If you put it on the Cour Carré, it's the, the same, uh, the same uh, diameters. Um, this dome, as I said, is, uh, is a very complex um, uh, dome. It is uh, composed of eight different layers uh, that are perforated uh, in a different way and that create, uh, w will create a rain of light. 
uh, we, we of course uh, worked with different patterns that uh, we could, uh, that we started uh, changing and adapting to something that would become this, uh, this perforation of the dome. But this was dictated not only by aesthetics, but uh, also climate issues and comfort issues, where we wanted, for example, in this uh, internal spaces, there were zones where we wanted more shadows, some that where we wanted more light. For example, we, we looked, we, we had a, a real cartography of the, of the spaces below to uh, decide where, uh, where we needed light and where we needed shadows. And this perforation and this superimposition of, the, of, all, the, of all the perforations of the dome uh, and this rain of light that would go through this w is, is the result of all these different studies. Uh, this is the rain of light that uh, effect that uh, we, we are, are expecting, actually, we did a lot of tests, uh, not only uh, computer tests, but uh, models, we did mock-ups, etc. A ray of light that arrives at the first uh, um, uh, layer of, of the dome has to go through eight different uh, reflections or uh, before arriving to, 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 to a form that will appear and disappear. It is a cinetic effect that uh, is, is very uh, uh, in relation with the space, with the time, with the, you never see the same thing uh, in depending on the moment of the, of the day uh, or the moment of the year. Uh, of course, the presence of the water is very important because it participates to this reflection of the light and, the, and in these buildings that are all white. It's a high performance concrete cladding on all these buildings. These pilings are here also. There, there was a, an original reason for uh, security for people not uh, uh, being able to arrive quickly to this site. So we put these Venetian type piles uh, that also extend this idea of the museum and of this archaeology in the water. We, uh, the, the museum is uh, not only an internal space, but also external spaces. We are uh, proposing to put uh, um, pieces of art outside of the galleries. Uh, there are proposed um, statues, uh, there is a Mamluk pavement, for example, Rodin, but also contemporary commissions that will take place outside of the museum to complete the collection. We're also working on the museography and uh, yeah, this is the, the, the program that I was mentioning, permanent galleries, temporary gallery, auditorium. There's, of course, a, a treatment, a collection treatment building, um, cafe, restaurant. And so the red part here is the permanent collection, which is the object of the um, intergovernmental agreement. So this is where we will have 300 uh, 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 acquisitions and 300 loans that will con uh, transform to acquisitions. And we've been working on in this museography, on this museography. Um, the idea is to make this uh, these buildings. When you see them from outside, they look very small, but when you enter, they look big. It's like a little palace. And we wanted to give this uh, uh, notion of nobleness to these to to these. Uh, um, buildings and these interior where you are going to go inside, outside. It's, what's interesting actually is when we drew this, uh, this project, we didn't know that the Louvre was uh, uh, going to come. Uh, in it. We didn't know it was the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Actually, we, we visited the site the first time. It was with the director of the L'Hermitage of St. Petersburg, and we were convinced it's, it was going to be or L'Hermitage or British Museum. We, we didn't know. So this idea of, of little buildings was also to address a flexibility of uh, an evolving uh, uh, program. And that c can continue to evolve. And when we, we, when the agreement was signed, we redrew completely the project. But it was exactly uh, the same. I mean, we kept the concept, the original concept. 
So um, the program, the scientific program, cultural program, is a, a, a dialogue of civilization uh, starting from the ancient world through, through the modern, modern times. So of course you have antiquity to contemporary art. Uh, you have 12 museums involved in, in Paris from the Louvre to the Saint Pompidou. Uh, so with uh, Guimet, uh, Le Quai Branly, Versailles, uh, uh, all, all the big French uh, Parisian institution, not only Parisian because you have uh, la, la Bibliothèque Nationale, etc. So they all participate in this scientific program with these artworks to do something that is inter um, uh, civilizational, civilizational. Uh, so you see, for example, in one time, it's a chronological uh, parcours, and you see in one time the, the dialogue between different civilizations. Uh, these different uh, rooms that you go, this pala palatial effect uh, concept is uh, given by these different scales. You always have, as you see here, the, you always go from one your room to another by going through passages and you always have the consciousness of the space. And all these artworks that you see are um, displayed in relation with uh, 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 the interior and the exterior with the control of uh, artificial and natural light. Construction has started in 2009. Uh, we started the piling and then it stopped for a year. And this picture is, uh, is, uh, was taken in when it stopped, uh, one year after it stopped. And you see this all these piles where all the plan of the museum, like in an archeological field, as if they, they, it was there. We're on top of a mock-up of the dome that we did uh, uh, a year earlier to test the effect of the of the rain of light. This is where we realized that we had to reduce again the openings. Actually, the superimposition of all these layers in total give only 1.8 percent of uh, of light that go through. We tested, of course, the material maintenance and all the systems that could make this uh, this dome uh, efficient. Today, uh, we have completed the dome. These are pictures of the last month. And we are here uh, since last month. We achieved the, first, the structure of the dome. All the buildings are already built. The museum is uh, planned to open in one year, uh, December 2015. Uh, it's a big challenge. Uh, there are 5,000 workers on site. And, uh, and we are all mobilized to make this uh, project uh, happen and open on time. Thank you, Hala. I'd like to invite the panelists to the table and be joined by Nikolai Urusov. Uh, Nikolai is a New York-based writer and critic and former architect critic for the New York Times, where he wrote extensively on architecture and urbanism in the US, as well as in the Middle East. Previously, he was the architecture critic of the Los Angeles Times, where he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2004 for a series of the, uh, for, on a, for a series on the cultural decline of Baghdad. He is currently writing a book, a mega, mega book, uh, on architecture, culture, and politics from the birth of modernism until today. And he will be joined by Mabel Wilson, the Nancy and George E. Rupp professor here at the school, as well as the co-director of the Global Africa Lab. Mabel's scholarly research investigates space and cultural memory in black America, race and visual culture. Um, new Technologies and the Social Production of Space. Her recent book, Negro Building, Black and the World of Fairs and Museums, studies how the spaces of world's fairs, emancipation exhibitions, and grassroots public museums became sites to imagine Afro-modernity. She also is the co-founder of Who Builds Your Architecture. Welcome, Nikolai and Mabel, to the table.
Okay, I think we're ready to begin. Uh, again, thank you to our organizers, Amal, um, Nora, I think, for putting together an extraordinary um, panel of, of projects, but also within the overall, I think, conversation of the conference. And I think there are definitely some connections between the previous panels and, um, and this one. So I'm just gonna start out um, with some comments on, on projects that I think are really quite extraordinary and quite beautiful um, in terms of their execution. But one of the things that brings up the question of representation um, is also the fact that architects depend on representations fundamentally to do their work. Um, architects make drawings that then are read in order, to, in order to build, and that fundamentally we've seen how the representations operate to begin to describe things, I think in all three cases that are in the process of actually, actually being built. But I also think there's the question of how representations actually inform the final building itself um, as well. So I think the question of representation, particularly on this panel, could be talked about, I think, in, in, in multiple ways. Um, um, I think there were other, you know, two, two of the issues that I thought were, were quite interesting in, in, in all three of the projects, and I would use the Kulhasian index of medium, large, and extra large, and, and I think Ali's and, and, and Hala's project maybe vie for extra largeness, but um, um, I think there is something about the question of scale in all three projects that begin to intersect with how one begins to test questions around locality. I think in in your project um, in Biblos, um, Hashem, um, I think as you started to describe the origins of the project and, and it's, it's the history of the city, you, you very, um, I think, poetically described that this place actually has multiple layers of both political, religious regimes that have actually shaped the culture. And so I think the question of representation of identity becomes very interesting and like whose identity is in fact going to be represented in this project in this town that has historically had multiple layers of, 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 of cultures or cultural presence. And so I think the question of the scale of the building as it relates to local conditions become quite interesting. And I think in your case, the sandstone becomes one way of referencing locality, I think. But also in your case, there's a kind of counter move to so, sort of even resist that expression where the sandstone becomes a kind of thinness, right? Becomes a, a, literally a, a kind of floating signifier of the region itself and is to be read as such, you know, something that in fact could be dislocated in relationship to its reading of, of, of locality. And I think that's interesting in, in that regard. And in, your, in that project, I was curious about why they chose to, to use black and white drawings, I would assume within the competition, and what that was attempting to mute and neutralize um, in, in that. And so that was one of the questions I had for that. And I think in, in Hala and Ali, your projects in terms of the extra large scale, I mean, I think you described um, the museum as literally an urban project, that fundamentally the organization of the program of the museum it's so large that it operates at a kind of urban scale. And so how to pull that together and how to think about a building of that scale as an urban project, even so as it was originally conceptualized as not even having a client, a specific client. It was a project that was almost in search of a client, first the Hermitage and eventually, eventually the, the Louvre. And so the extra large, I think, also challenges questions of locality and legibility as it, the extra large begins to, I think, operate at a global scale of audience or a different scale of potentially audience that fundamentally nonetheless has to connect with local conditions. And I think the question of scale in the same way, um, um, Ali, with your, your building, I think the way in which you start to deal with the, the question of iconography on the surface and the way in which that can be read, again, at multiple scales, whether it's at the monumental scale of the building, but also in the particular way in which you start to extract and abstract that into certain moments inside the building, I think you found a kind of language that can operate between the extra large scale of what the project is trying to produce, but the particular scale of, of inhabitation. And so I think within all three projects, the question of, of scale has a, has a fascinating impact in terms of how form is read, but also how form is also being located. Um, and and that, again, that goes back to the question of legibility. And so I think there can be, I think, more talked about in relationship to these. And Nikolai. Should I you jump wanna, in and comment, yeah, or should comment. we have some answers? Yeah, I, no, why don't you jump in and comment? And okay, can, yeah. okay. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that I noticed this, this afternoon in particular is I was struck by the differences, I mean, just how extreme the differences are in this, uh, between working for all these architects, working in the West, working in the Gulf, working in Lebanon and other parts of the Middle East. And I think that the, 
you know, in the last 15, 20 years, the challenges in terms of what's happened to architecture during that period is so radically different. I mean, when I think of the, one of the biggest issues um, in the West during the, this kind of late free market period is how architecture's been used as a kind of a form of camouflage more and more. And it's lost a lot of its um, ideological connection or power, especially after the um, collapse of the Soviet Union. Whereas in the Middle East, and especially in the Gulf, <coughs> I think that it still is, um, it's one of the few places where there is still, it's very ideologically charged. Um, and especially in the two projects that you were talking about um, in the Gulf, um, where they're both, part, in very different ways, parts of an agenda that's about really shaping national identity. Um, but I think um, when you're talking about, you're talking about also Western architects uh, working at the invitation of a ruling family. Um, and you're talking about cultures where um, the uh, cultural history is Bedouin and therefore from the perspective of kind of urban fabric, very thin. I and mean, I think, Paula, you actually said that there was no real history in Abu Dhabi to look at at, at some point. And so I'm kind of curious to see how you operate, I guess the two of you in that context, and then you're talking about a very different context, obviously, in Lebanon where you're dealing with um, so many different layers of audiences simultaneously. Um, whereas the audience um, in, um, in the Gulf is in a, a strange way a kind of international audience in the sense that they're trying to project an image of national identity and shape national identity, your clients are, um, both for their own people or a segment of their own population, um, uh, which in Doha is just a couple of million people really and also project an image of who they are to the world in a kind of um, post-September 11th kind of condition, or reframe or reshape their identities in the world. And all of that, I think, makes uh, for a very difficult, very complicated questions for all of you in terms of you operate in all of these different conditions. One of the things I noticed in looking at your work, I mean, Jean's work I know obviously very well, but I'll be looking at your work, for example, in, when we're talking about the subject of this conference is these two different ways of trying to connect through architectural language to context. And one seems to be um, uh, uh, reworking kind of traditional elements, whether it's the dome or mashrabiya, which are kind of it, both involved in the, in, in the structure of, of the Louvre, or this kind of on this metaphoric level, um, which uh, the National Museum, for example, in, um, uh, in Doha, for example, and I've seen in your work, Ali, also both languages, sometimes a mix of the two in the project you showed today. Um, and we're talking about the, this, this kind of condition of a Western architect working for a very powerful authoritarian ruling family and trying to create these images of identity. I'm kind of curious how you choose these languages and if there's one that um, seems more rooted or not than the other, for example. I mean, I know that you'd worked on a small project that's kind of a metaphor for a starfish that somehow is supposed to relate to um, uh, the fishing history of Abu Dhabi. And in the, in, in the case of the National Museum in Doha, it's the sand rose, right? Um, so how you kind of develop a language as a kind of outsider in that culture, I guess, is the question I'm asking. When, you're, when you have all of these kind of, you know, certain demands by the clients too. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, there was a discussion this morning about identity and I think you're right in saying that the identity is being created now in mm -hmm. the, the Abu Dhabi and even Doha are, are now, if we can say, in a, they're doing their golden age and mm -hmm. trying to see what is this identity. Uh, of course, we're trying to find all the all the reasons. It's not just a language. It's the b before the language. It's the meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's how to make sense somewhere. So once we we have this idea and this question about what is a museum there, and that we know that we want to do. I mean, these first mm -hmm. ideas that we had about the city and the dome is how we do it now today with. In, in, in a contemporary way of today. Mm -hmm. And how do we use the language of today to interpret this? 
And this was what it was interesting for us to do. Uh, if even for the, the buildings, the traditional building, it's very traditional, these little cities, but we're using a very contemporary technique to do it. But the dome is, was quite a challenging uh, thing to do. And again, it's just not just a, a language, it's, um, it's all these different uh, uh, means that we were going to put in place and that we have in our hands to make something that is beyond the culture or the identity is, is the, re the relation, the um, emotion that someone can have with the, with the light. And uh, so we, we, we developed this uh, together with a, a lot of um, um, different means to, to do this uh, very complex uh, instrument or, or of, of light. Uh, like Jean did uh, also 30 years ago with the Arab World Institute also. Mm -hmm. It was the same kind of approach, is how to reinterpret something that is the, uh, the, the Msharabi in something with a very contemporary uh, language. Mm -hmm. And the, actually, and the dome of the of the tower in Doha for Sheikh Salman. Also, well. yeah, yeah. also, yes. Yeah. I think um, from our side, anyway, um, we're not. Um, we understand that obviously um, that Qatar has has a position in, in the global context, and uh, but we we think that they, there is a determination in education which is quite um, embold emboldening. Let's say in, in the sense that other Gulf states are not so preoccupied with the idea of education in, in a sense that uh, the inclusion of women and inclusion of, 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 I mean, the whole of Education City campus is co-ed. And one of the ideas for our project is to demonstrate how Islam post 9-11 is also a very kind of progressive uh, religion, let's say. I mean, not necessarily the, the idea of the school, the madrasa, and sort of the images we get or negative images that we get of, of the mosque and of, of teaching and learning and how these can be centers for, for radicalism. I think the idea of our project is the idea that Islam can be progressive, can be modern, can be contemporary, but at the same time, the project can be legible to both the, the global and the local audience. In other words, the use of, of calligraphy, the use of, 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 of ideas which are quite local in, in nature, I think, make it, make it real, make it, make it much more tangible to, to the audience which is local, which is actually gonna use the building so I think, I think on three levels, obviously it, it, it is an Islamic icon, it's an Islamic icon for something in the future, mm -hmm. and at the same time it's about education. So I think um, those three elements are the ones that we're trying to, to play with. I probably, well, I was gonna say, yeah, we don't wanna miss the, uh, that's the funny thing about the format, we wanna get back to some of Mabel's questions yes. too. On the question of scale, which has a lot to do with the relative size of things in relation to each other, but also as perceived. Uh, from the beginning, the massing of the town hall was meant to appear bigger than it actually is. Obviously, it needs to be seen from the highway, and the repetition of the form and the speed at which you see it helps make it recognizable. Uh, but it also is bigger than it actually is by virtue of bearing the burden of being the town hall, and therefore having to carry in it in a kind of very concentrated way all possible images that people might have about the city. So in a way, by withdrawing from imagery initially, uh, we were trying, at least deliberately, not to engage in one layer or the other. But the imagery came back, and it came back through different means. It came back through uh, the fact that the volumes themselves were obviously evoking some of the monolithic structures that were to be found on the archaeological sites, and you know, again, the different audiences read that in it. Some of the more generous readings of the building uh, were, oh, it, it's like you're taking the castle and putting it on the highway. Uh, the less generous ones saying, oh, you're building Abu Ghraib in Biblos. But uh, we're, we're still getting different interpretations. Fortunately, the stone has worked to calm down quite a few people. But on the question of it communicating and the thinness that you, uh, you alluded to, I am myself very much invested in the idea that we write on the buildings. And almost all my projects, we write on the buildings. And not just writing on the surface, but almost inscribing. Uh, for one reason, I find it to be liberating of that burden of representation. Someone else is writing. Even if I am writing, it's not the same hand. 
uh, but also inscription allows for you to have the image suspended or the register suspended between two extreme positions that architecture today has been taking. One where uh, this kind of monomania of architecture wanting to take on the responsibility of everything through the integrity of the surface and the surface weave, etc. And on the other, the idea that the surface is an image. In the inscription, you push and the surface pushes back. You impose on it something from the outside and it just tells you that, no, my tectonic logic allows for only so much. And I like that, but I also find that to be an opportunity for languages mixing on the surface, a kind of over-determination. The barcode casting a shadow on the, uh, on the script on the wall or the uh, two codes intersecting with the Phoenician letter in an open-ended way, not something that I control. But also the possibility that other languages can come in, that the architecture is at once framework and communicating. I mean, I think what I thought was interesting about the way in which you described even the sandstone in terms of how it was built, that it seemed to be also a dialogue with the, uh, the builder or the, the, the stone the stonemason who was in fact laying it, and so that you said there was a there was a level, you know, in which they could sort of interpret into, and it seems the larger scale projects have that challenge because of the scale and because also you know that these cities are quite new, the education city are quite new, um, you know, sort of, you know, where where does one find that 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 place to literally inscribe, or how does the surface not be smooth, so that you know that that it doesn't simply fall away, but it actually holds on to something. As well, but it seems like we have we have to open it oh, up for audience not, questions. <laughs> I guess so. Okay. So it's more common. Yeah. Yeah. Question. yeah. Okay. I think we have to we have to give him a chance to answer because this clock moves so fast. Sorry, the influence of which architecture? <coughs> I mean the, the You're saying Western, Western education, the fact that we're approaching it from a kind of um, my first I speak from a personal stance. I mean obviously our, my origin is, is I'm born in the UK, but my parents are South African and Indian and Muslim by, by, by my name, let's say. But, so I understand the culture I'm operating in. I'm fascinated by the culture I'm operating in. At the same time, I understand there is a deficit of, uh, let's say, architectural practice within the region that is endemic to the region. And I think from, from our side, we're not approaching it from the point of view of, of a neo-colonial uh, architecture. We, we want to try to engage. We want to try to understand what, in the case of Education City, what Education City wants and what wants to create in terms of a building. And I think this is, this is kind of true to what we're, we're, what we're doing. Obviously, we can offer different ways of doing things. We can offer a kind of a whole computer analysis for how we can resolve problems. Uh, and I think that's appropriate. But um, what is not appropriate is, is to rely on, on kind of an invented tradition, an invented kind of vernacular uh, that actually doesn't even, doesn't even exist in the region. So I think... Um, you know, we need to be quite real. Obviously, there, there are other parts of, of Qatar, other parts of Doha, where there is an emphasis on, on kind of a postmodern uh, architecture, but um, we're, we're not looking at it from the point of view of what is wrong and right. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly approaching it from the point of view of understanding the culture in which I operate in and, and not to try to overlay it with my own set of ideals and principles, I think. 
I think we have time for maybe one more question, if it's quick, or two if it's really quick. I wanted to ask a question about materiality because I think the sandstone from Hashem and the enormous amount of steel from Hala also gives us a chance to think maybe about the socio and political power that's tied into these forms of materiality that then produce forms of representation. Um, and especially in the kind of the last panel thinking about how the relationship between the architect and the client, which is obviously always the dominant one in which architects think about form of power, but maybe to also think about um, the different materials that are used and how they are also connected to very specific forms of socio-political and, of course, economic um, circuits of, um, of power. Someone want to answer that quickly? Well, I mean, on, on the Louvre, would that be the material? Is, we, we are in a very constraining uh, climate and situation. So, uh, I mean, we, we it, and it's a project that is here to last uh, very long. So we, it was very constraining. We had to find materials. Uh, first of all, we wanted them to be very contemporary. So we, there are two or three materials that we're using. It's the high performance concrete and for the dome, Again, it's a very challenging uh, feature. It's, it's a, a, a huge structure that is sitting on only four points. It's very horizontal. It's very difficult to do in terms of structure. So it's, it's all in metal. Uh, it's in uh, stainless steel uh, for the outside and uh, aluminum inside. And this materiality is also addressing, again, this uh, um, idea of uh, the vibration of the light uh, something very precious outside and the vibration of the light on the white uh, buildings below. Uh, I, yeah, for B plus initially, I wanted it to be made out of steel. It was a steel box hung. Even the floors were hung from above so that it emphasized even more through structure the idea that the park is continuing underneath it. Uh, they wouldn't let me. I'm still convinced that it's actually cheaper to build it that way than to build it out of that local material that everybody trusts, which is concrete. But uh, we went with concrete. And we managed somehow to hide, not so well, I think, the columns that will hold the box up, but uh, at least the spans itself clear. Uh, I do not think that any of the materials in this particular project are uh, tectonically present in the sense that they are not uh, integral to the structure. The elements that are expressive are divorced of the structure. Uh, it's a new approach for me. I'm, I'm interested to see the effect. I think on that note, we have to end. <laughs>